Eli is so awesome. I just want to give him a round of applause because he's so awesome. You know, it's a lot of work putting these events on, and he does such an awesome job at it. And of course, I love your energy, so thank you. And thank you all for having me here. I'm going to take one uh, 10 second break to swap the slide decks, so just bear with me. Refreshing pause. Um, so I'm Lauren Bacon, and I'm a partner at Raised Eyebrow Web Studio. And Eli just uh, said a fair amount about me, so I won't go on too much. But I'll just say, um, so I have about 15 years, maybe a little more, of experience uh, working with nonprofits, specifically in the online space. So I've been uh, designing, building, project managing, strategizing about websites and other online projects uh, with nonprofits for a very long time. Uh, so the presentation I'm doing tonight is really uh, an evolution of all of that work, all of that collective work. I also used to work in the nonprofit sector before I got into tech. Uh, so I was actually a performing artist for a few years um, before I uh, discovered building websites and kind of fell in love with that and abandoned my um, perhaps budding or perhaps flailing performing career uh, and, uh, and moved into the tech space and have been kind of loving that ever since. And now, you know, we work with a whole bunch of different nonprofit groups, uh, mostly nonprofits. We also work with some public, public sector clients um, and a few um, businesses that we kind of loosely call uh, progressive businesses. Um, but uh, primarily, our, our, the groups that we work with are, are mostly in the nonprofit sector. So um, we have a great passion for working with. Um, the kinds of people. I'm assuming most of you here tonight are in the nonprofit sector. Is that true? Just by a show of hands. Okay, I'm seeing like half. So, um, are the rest of you techies? No. Okay. Um, well, uh, I look forward to hearing more about where the rest of you are from after the event. Um, and I hope that this presentation is useful to those of you who, are, who fall outside the nonprofit sector as well. Um, so what I do these days is primarily actually strategy work and planning of website projects. Um, and I have a, a much larger team than I initially started out with. I used to do all the coding work and the design work and all of that stuff myself. Um, and now I have people who are way better at that than I, than I am. And, um, and I get to just kind of um, put my head in the clouds and think big picture about, about big strategies. So what I want to talk about tonight is just uh, what goes into a successful redesign project. And this isn't going to be about uh, what content management system you should use, or um, you know, what color palette, how you choose a color palette. It's really about how do you engage uh, in, how do you plan and engage in a project that's going to be a successful project for your organization? Um, and how do you work with vendors, such as Raised Eyebrow or other you know, website developers and designers, um, effectively to create a product that's going to really meet your overall needs? Um, so uh, what I'm going to run through is, uh, a sort of a five-part recipe for success. So one is what do you already know is not working. Also, think like your audience or your community. Uh, audit your website content, and that's probably a step that's not super familiar with to a lot of you, but it's an important one. Um, knowing your numbers and kind of talking a little bit about how to analyze your, your analytics, and uh, how to assemble your team. And I'm going to spend the most time on this uh, on the last one because I think it's actually the most critical part. So we're going to talk a lot about people and how to work with uh, effectively with large groups of people. And one of the things I've noticed and learned from many years of working with nonprofit groups is just the importance of consulting with a large group of stakeholders and about having a really effective process in place for how you're going to do that and consistently looping people in as they need to be looped in. So let's start with what's not working now. I think a lot of us can actually do this pretty quickly on a gut level. What's not working about your current website? Um, so, you know, just figure out what your pain points are. Um, it, it's a really good place to start. So it might be the CMS software you're using is just not functioning or some other key functionality, uh, like your donation form is not working, or you're not able to integrate stuff with your email list, or your members only area has never really worked properly, or nobody's using it. Um, 
maybe it's an aesthetic or a visual problem. Uh, it could be uh, branding or content, or it could be all of the above. So uh, start by just identifying your pain points and writing them down. And uh, that'll form the, really the foundation of your website redesign project, because if you don't hit those notes, if you don't fix those problems and feel, you know, then you won't feel like you've got a successful project at the end if your uh, fundamental problems are not solved. So that's step number one. Um, and I've kind of written up, like, what I would suggest as a poll for yourself. Just what's your gut check? Um, what's the number one problem on your current website? Is it that people can't find the information they're looking for? That's a big one for a lot of people. Is it that the visual design really needs updating and is like cringingly, you know, un unattractive to look at? Is it you just can't make it do what you need it to do from a technical perspective? Or it's all of the above and you just need to fix everything? And if you can just get kind of to a point of like ranking those things in some way, that's gonna form the basis of your RFP, of your project brief with your vendors, and just of your measures of success for the whole project. And it'll also actually, the other important thing is, it'll help you evaluate the success of your website once the project launches. If you know exactly what it, you know, if you know the visuals were actually the most important thing for us to get up to date, with, you know, the functionality was basically there and, and our content was pretty good, but, but nobody was able to stand to look at it because it was all in this acid yellow background, <laughs> you know, then you know, you know, you can just resolve that one piece and, and you can also potentially do the work iteratively, sorry, I'm trying to make love to the microphone as Eli instructed me to, and I might be overdoing it a little bit. Let me know if, if anybody's having trouble hearing. Just like, hold your, okay. Um, all right, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how we connect with our community. This is step number two. So um, who do you wanna connect with? When we talk about target audiences or target markets or, or the communities we wanna reach, it really means people or communities who we wanna connect with. So um, they're not just people who are kind of sitting there passively waiting to receive your gospel, um, much as we might like to imagine that people are, are doing that. It's not typically how people are visiting our websites. So ultimately, you want all of your project decisions to evolve out of consideration for these people, since the success of all of your communications and community building efforts really rests on those people and connecting with them. So uh, before you develop your content and functionality plan, it's important to know exactly who you want to engage um, and consider investing in some basic uh, audience research or community research. Um, so that could be surveys of your current website users. Um, it could be people who are not yet on your website but you know you're engaging with in other ways, offline or, or whatever, you know, whether you're, uh, they're coming to your events but maybe they're not on your email newsletter list or uh, you're seeing them on the, the donor list uh, or the member list but they're not actually interacting with you online yet. Make sure that you're covering those bases and not just surveying the people who are already uh, engaged with you online um, because ideally what you want to do is actually connect with the people who aren't already deeply connected or deeply hooked in to every uh, medium that you already have going. So. Um, Audience research stuff, it can be very basic, like a survey, or it can be quite broad, and it's something that, you know, your vendor can actually help you with, so, um, in especially in terms of keeping you focused, because a lot of the time when you start doing uh, audience surveying work or, or research within your organization, um, everybody can kind of want a piece of the pie, and if you're trying to focus on the online communications, and then donor development wants to, like, learn about, you know, some fundraising stuff, and and then, oh, maybe member engagement wants to, you know, so it, the survey can get very diffuse very quickly. There's a lot of value, mind you, in integrating those things and in getting a broad view, but you do want to keep it focused so that people don't have so many questions that they just run out of steam and aren't willing to answer them all. So, um, so sometimes, anyway, working with your vendor can sometimes help keep you on track and they'll sometimes just come in as the, this is one of the, the values of being a consultant, you get to come in and, and tell people what those people, you know, inside the organization have been saying for months but nobody will listen to them because they actually work there. So I get to come in and sort of repeat that and people actually listen to me. <laughs> so, so, uh, so if you're having trouble getting heard uh, from your bosses, your higher-ups, your boards, whatever, uh, feel free to just ask your consultant to do that dirty work for you. Um, but also the other thing is the vendor's job really is to advocate for that end user in every, at least that's how I view my role. 
um, and, and really just to ensure that the website resonates with the people who you want to reach. Um, once you get a little bit of data, and some of this, I will say, can actually be done on a gut level. So it depends. There's a whole spectrum of ways you can do this work. Um, and I'm not going to have time to get into all of them tonight. Like surveying is one. You can do focus groups if you have a lot of time and money resources, or even you know maybe more time than money. Um, you can also, uh, you may have a very clear idea just from working with your your uh, constituents who those people are. So if you want to just write down a list and you feel really confident that you know who those people are, then that's great, and that's where a lot of people start. Um, one of the things that's helpful from, a, from our perspective as, a, as an outside firm being engaged to kind of do the design work and stuff is if you can kind of group those, uh, those, those communities in some useful ways. So there's a few different ways you can do that. Um, one is if you have target demographics in mind, like you have sort of particular age ranges or uh, their gender or uh, income based or, or geographic or whatever, um, that, that kind of stuff can be useful. Um, that's not typically how most nonprofit organizations tend to group their constituents, but we sometimes see that with, uh, with businesses and so on. Um, a, a more typical nonprofit grouping would be around grouping by type. So, you know, members are looking for this kind of information and donors want to interact with us in, in this way, uh, our board is going to have specific needs around the website. So breaking down your kind of your audience segments in that way can be really valuable. And it's also just a, a helpful way for you to step outside of your own role and how you normally interact with the website if you can kind of imagine yourself coming to the website as a member or as a person who just heard about your issue on the news and did a Google search and found your website for the first time. Um, I find it really helpful to just kind of put, be able to put that mental hat on and, and then envision what might be the most useful thing for me to see. You can also do a, a vendors like us a favor by ranking the importance of those groups. And it's not necessarily something that you want to communicate to the outside world that some groups are more important than others. But some groups are more important than others, um, at least for your website. You know, like your board may be 10 people who come to the website, you know, a couple times a year. So you're not going to cater your entire website strategy to that group, um, much as you want them to have the stuff that's useful to them, available to them at their uh, fingertips. Um, Oh, and one other way that you can group people also is just by interest, right? So they may not fall into a particular category of constituent. They may just have a variety of different interests. So we know, uh, while well, I'm thinking about, uh, we did a website recently for Watershed Watch Salmon Society. So they have um, academics who are really interested in you know, accessing their academic papers. Um, and then they have kind of more kind of general public environmentalists who um, need things who are, that are um, maybe not quite at the like PhD level in terms of the way that they're, they're phrased. So, um, so just kind of thinking about that, that can also be another way of grouping people. So I want to talk a little bit about auditing your content. Um, this can be an incredibly valuable exercise to undertake. Um, and again, this can be done with your selected vendor, or if you want, you can do it on your own ahead of time. Uh, and that depends on your preference and also what kind of staff resources you have and whether it's a valuable way for you to spend your own internal time or whether you want to just contract it out to somebody. Um, the process is this. It's very straightforward. You come through your existing website page by page and you laboriously enter everything into a spreadsheet. Um, not the actual content of the page, but what you capture is the title of the page, the URL of the page, um, sorry, I'll, uh, this is what it actually looks like. This is a sample from a client who uh, gave me permission to share. Uh, so this is it's page name on the left, um, and you'll notice that they're kind of bolded and highlighted and indented, and that's just to show the hierarchy of sections and pages in the site. Um, the URL the document type, and the document type might be, I use this column for all different kinds of things depending on the organization. Um, we just did one of these for our raised eyebrow website, which is uh, sorely in need of a redesign and finally getting it. Um, and, uh, and you know, and I created, and basically I, I used it to kind of designate the template for the page. So like a team bio page is one type of page or a blog post or whatever. So, um, so you can kind of use that in a flexible way, but generally the kind of concept is what template do you want to use. Um, 
The owner and maintainer, this is the most awesome column because it tells you who is responsible for keeping this content up to date. Um, and you can, if you are the owner of this document, you can um, get really uh, uh, powerful and assign duties to people. <laughs> uh, but it's a very, very helpful way to just easily, quickly reference who's, who's in charge of this, who do I need to check in with if I think this is getting out of date. Um, then there's the other awesome column. It's called OUCH. OUCH is an acronym. It stands for outdated, unnecessary, current, or have to write. So, um, and all you have to do in that column is just write, you know, an O, and a U, a C, or an H. And it tells you kind of where, like, how useful is this content right now. Um, if it's, I do this kind of, I'm kind of a spreadsheet geek, so I really like using Google Docs for this. And I like putting conditional formatting on it, so that if it's have to write, it shows up in red. Um, and that means it's like urgent that we take care of it, you know, and if it's uh, outdated, then it's yellow and it's kind of less urgent. If it's current, it's green, let's go, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, but anyway, you can use it to your heart's content, but that's, that's how I like to use that column. Um, these guys also have a column for French because they're, they have a site that's bilingual and they wanted to track whether it had been translated. Uh, and then there's just a notes column, which you can use however you like. Um, so all of that stuff is really helpful to capture. Um, if you want to, if you know that your priorities are just to get, you know, some of the columns filled in, I'm not going to hold you to it. Um, but um, but what you can do with this once it's done, um, I, there's a couple things. One is that the process itself is highly valuable because it gives you a chance to actually go through your site and just review, like where is everything actually at? How outdated is the content? How much work do we have to do? Do we actually need to hire a writer or writers to take care of this? Um, and also in terms of scheduling your project, this is the number one place our clients have always, always, always gotten bogged down because everybody underestimates how much content creation work is involved in a redesign. Um, it's not just that you're, you know, even if you were preserving exactly the same navigation structure and you weren't going to add any new pages at all, which is highly unlikely, but even if you were going to do that, chances are you haven't looked at your website content very carefully since the last time your website was launched. And that's probably three or four years ago. So there's probably quite a lot of work that needs to be done to just bring it up to date and make it actually useful and valuable for your site visitors. And that can be everything from like just the, the core content of the page itself to you know search engine optimization to adding some images to breaking it down with some subheadings to make it more legible, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, so it will really help you evaluate how much work you have to do to update your content. So there's something on the previous slide I didn't get to that I just wanted to say. Um, oh yeah, uh, just that please remember that this is a snapshot of your existing site. So it's not necessarily a, a planning framework for your new site, but it does help you kind of see a lay of the land and get, okay, where did we focus our content efforts last time? What you're, Once you engage a vendor um, in a redesign process, you'll likely come up with a whole new site map, right? Like the, part of that whole process is going to be brainstorming about uh, the communication strategy and the content that's going to go on the site and all that kind of stuff. So you're going to probably come up with a new framework for how people are going to navigate, uh, for how you want the content structured, and for how you want the messaging to actually come across. So there will be new content to develop, and what you can do then is create, if you like, um, if you're a spreadsheet geek like me, you can create a second version, um, and you can port over, you know, the old URL that maps to some of the new ones. So if you know, you know, the about us page at least is like just needs updating, and you can ge generally port it over from the old the old page. Um, you, you can port that stuff over from one spreadsheet to the next as well, and you can help map that out. But the content inventory, this 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 content uh, inventory spreadsheet, is really an evolving document. And the whole idea of it is that you can just keep updating, you can keep adding to it over time. Um, so it's a very valuable thing to have if you have the time and patience for it. Um, and I highly recommend um, tasking, if you, if you can't stand the idea of doing this yourself, um, this is a great project for a volunteer. Because it's, it's fairly um, predictable and like, you know, they just have to walk through the menu or the site map or whatever and just go through it page by page. Um, but make sure that they have you actually report out to you um, so that they're coming back to you and, and not just giving you the spreadsheet, 
but giving you kind of a high level analysis of what they found because they're not going to know the content and messaging strategy stuff as well as you do. So they're going to be looking at it through a very specific filter. Um, so the, the grunt work can be done by a volunteer, but important that you interview them afterwards and ask them um, some key questions about uh, what they found, um, how did they actually find reading through some of the content? You know, did, did, it, engage with, did it engage them on, on any level? <laughs> uh, that kind of stuff can be very valuable as well. All right. Step three, know your numbers. Uh, so um, this is all about using analytics as a snapshot of where you're currently at. This is also useful information when you're trying to project into the future and compare your next generation website to your current one. Um, what we're trying to do is really uh, get a sense of you have goals for what your next generation site is going to do for you. This is just to get a sense of what's the lay of the land right now so that you have something useful to compare to once the new site is live. So number one thing is make sure that you can access your existing stats. Um, this is, we've run into this more than once where, uh, you know, actually nobody knows what the login for Google Analytics is or um, nobody ever bothered to actually check that the analytics package actually was working and it turns out that no analytics have been being gathered for the last six months. Um, so before you start your redesign project, it can be super helpful to just double check this right out of the gate. Because um, at the very least you can gather, you know, a month or two of the statistics while the redesign is, is underway. Um, so uh, that's number one. Um, there's quite a few things you can analyze. Um, we could do uh, one or more whole sessions on analytics, but I'm not going to get too deep into it. What I can say is, um, A, my recurring refrain, which is that your vendor can actually help you with this and identify, because what you want to do is map your particular site goals with the analytics reports that you have available and c compare them. So if your goals are, uh, if your goals are to increase site traffic or increase newsletter signups or, or whatever they are, um, you know, we can, we can kind of analyze a little bit in terms of the stats, what's, what's happening now and, and what are the metrics we would actually look at to kind of calculate that stuff. So some of the more typical things that people tend to watch for um, and that you would definitely want to capture at the very minimum would be page views, um, overall visitors, number of visitors, uh, your search engine ranking for various keywords. One of the things Google Analytics does is it has like a, a really good keywords interface to show you what keywords people are using to find your site. Um, and a lot of the time what we find is that the um, top 10 keywords are all the name of the organization in some permutation. Um, that's okay and it's not atypical, but um, what you probably would like to have happen is to actually see the issues that you're addressing coming up as keywords that are driving people to your site, not just the name of the organization. Um, so, uh, or you know, just even the names of people who are in leadership positions within the organization. We had one, um, actually when we did the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS redesign, one of their goals was, you know, when people search for our researchers, they don't find our website. And they have some of the most prominent HIV and AIDS researchers in the world. So it's really important that when you Google Evan Wood, that the Center for Excellence's website come up. So, you know, there are, there are, there are some ways in which, again, that's a great place where we were able to see in their existing analytics that that was not happening for them. And after the site launched, we were able to reassess it and make sure that we had achieved that goal. Um, another thing you can often track in, in your analytics is just conversion rates, so conversion to newsletter signups. Um, you can set goals in Google Analytics to help you track specific uh, page paths that you want people to follow, um, and just sort of user engagement in general. So, uh, the, and then the further back into the past you can go, the more helpful it is, because we, we love to see trending uh, whenever possible. Um, so, uh, I'm just repeating myself here a little bit. Um, one of the things that I will say is that the other reason that I encourage you to engage your vendor a little bit in this process, or at least share your analytics with the vendors, a vendor or vendors that you're kind of considering working with, is that um, they can actually compare those stats to other similar organizations and get a sense of kind of where you're sitting in the ecosystem of the nonprofit world. Um, so, 
because we have a, a breadth of experience and we can kind of tell you, uh, give you a sense of like, oh, that's very high traffic for a healthcare nonprofit, for example. All right, I promised I was going to spend most of my time here, so uh, I'm going to do that. <laughs> It's, uh, this is the people part of the equation, and it's really the most critical thing to get right. Um, I mean, we, we obviously, we want return on investment, and we want you to hit all of your measures of success, and um, we ideally want you to pay a lot of attention to your content and all of that stuff, but I think the number one cause for the redesign processes that end in tears um, is the people part. <laughs> so, um, you, you have to get buy-in from all of your key stakeholders. So, um, for a typical nonprofit organization, that's probably going to include your executive director, the head of communications, uh, the member, member engagement or member uh, management people, um, the donor development people, if that's a separate group, um, and ideally key board members or at least the president of your board. Um, my experience with, with boards is that they don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day part of the redesign, but they do kind of want to see updates now and then and feel consulted. Um, I say that as a board member as well. <laughs> I, I just like to kind of know that I have the option of giving input or of whatever, you know. Um, if you have an internal ID, IT department, you want to bring them in too. Um, and if you have distributed offices, um, then you may want some involvement from your field offices as well. So we see very quickly this can become a very large people to manage. Um, you know, I know, I re recognize that like not every nonprofit organization has, you know, buckets and buckets of people. Um, but even the smallest nonprofit organizations I've worked with tend to have, at the very minimum, a bunch of like volunteers or board members or people kind of floating about, you know, the founder who's still kind of vaguely involved or the, you know, and, and, and so, um, so having you know people management strategy, I think, is helpful, even if you're like a two-person office of actual staff. So um, there are a lot of different strategies that you can undertake, uh, but here's one that has worked for a lot of our clients in the past, um, and there's definitely kind of variations on this as well. So number one is circulate an email to all interested parties that states the nature of the project and invites them to participate and join you in a conversation just to define the goals and priorities for the redesign. So that's the full scope of what you're asking for. It's like, I am convening a meeting. <laughs> I would like you to participate in helping to define the goals uh, for this project. Um, you're not promising them that they're gonna be involved at every step of the process or anything like that, but you are asking for their initial input. Um, and include a meeting invitation in that email. Um, so this is kind of their, it's very, it's important to kind of like emphasize that this is, this is kind of a make or break moment for them. <laughs> like, like if they want, if they're excited about this project, if they want to be involved in the website redesign, this is the most important meeting they can attend. Uh, which is, you know, because if they're not involved in setting the priorities and the goals, then their priorities and goals will not be included in the plan. Um, and, you know, and if you're, for example, taking this to write, go write an RFP afterwards that you're going to use to actually get estimates from vendors and all of that kind of stuff, and those goals and priorities from those people are not included in that RFP, then you're not going to get accurate estimates and a whole bunch of time will be wasted and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, very important that everybody who wants to have input is giving input at that meeting. Um, so, uh, step two, still before you have this call, I'm, I'm calling it a call because we have a lot of clients who um, have kind of distributed teams, but, you know, it could be an in-person meeting. Um, so before the call, share your observations and metrics. So this is where we go back to that, like, little poll I had at the beginning where you, you are saying, here's what I already know is not working. You know, here are some of the numbers we have from the current site that are concerning to me. Um, here are some of the communities that we want to be reaching who we know we're not reaching very well, etc. So start breaking that stuff down for the people you're assembling on the call. Um, a lot of time gets wasted in meetings just communicating that stuff verbally, and I can't emphasize enough how much time you'll save if you can just send that stuff out in a very brief uh, email report. Um, so, and it also just sets the tone. It, it helps people know this is a data-driven process. We're not just going to be talking about our feelings and the fact that we hate the color green and whatever. Like. We're, like, we're looking to have actual results and impact here. Um, so it helps them frame that. And it also um, ensures that your time 
spent together as a group is spent effectively and efficiently. So, and then ask everyone to review your notes prior to the meeting. Number three, convene the call. Um, so revisit the problem areas that you've identified. That's a great place to kind of kick off the meeting. Uh, very briefly, you might want to show them some examples of comparative organizations' websites as well. Um, if there are sites that you think are particularly effective and that you feel like your organization might be compared to. Um, but keep, try to keep your presentation short, like 10 minutes max on a one hour call, because really your goal here is to open up a, a big discussion and facilitate a free form conversation amongst all of the parties to get input from everybody about his or her priorities for the redesign and kind of what, uh, what their goals are so that you can gather all of that input together. And everybody's going to have a different focus, right, because they work in a particular area and that's legit and you want to incorporate that stuff. Um, and, and then, but then once you've got everybody's input, ask the group to prioritize it. Um, and just prioritize the various suggestions. Okay, so I heard that, you know, these 15 things are all priorities. Um, if we had to choose five of those things, which would those five things be? Or, you know, just how critical is it? How mission critical is it going to be for our organization to hit all 15 of these, these priorities? Can we at least rank them in order of of most important to, to least important. Um, deciding on roles that everybody's gonna have. Not all of these people are gonna wanna be present at every meeting, we hope. Um, <laughs> but for your sake and for our sake, um, discuss who wants to be actively involved on the project team um, and, and, and what those roles are gonna be. And one of the things you can do is explain what the commitment level is it is that's involved because often we're talking about like weekly meetings over the course of a project and we're talking about the ability to respond to email inquiries within 24 hours and all this stuff not everybody's going to want to take that on so um, that's one way you can kind of filter out um, people who feel like they're keen but don't actually have the time and capacity to take stuff on and make sure that your project team is lean um, Critically important at this stage is that sign-off authority has to be granted to one person who is truly empowered to make decisions. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> number one, uh, specifically that would be the executive director. Um, if they are willing, we have had executive directors in the past as clients who were happy to delegate that authority to somebody else. The, the, the key thing is they have to mean it. So, um, and they have to understand what they're, what they're saying when they agree to that. So when they say, yes, I grant you, communications director, the ability to sign off on decisions, what they mean is they don't get to change their mind later and say, oh, actually, I really hate the design. Um, you know, so, uh, so make sure they understand that um, or that they're at least clear on what points they do want to be consulted on. Because um, it's uh, often hard, and I will say this as a boss, uh, it's one thing to kind of intend to delegate things, and it's another thing to actually let go of the control and power that you're used to wielding over things. So, um, so make sure that you have that conversation. If they don't want to be involved in meetings, they should really delegate sign-off authority to somebody else, but not everybody can live with the consequences of that. So um, it is totally okay for them to ask for progress reports. Um, and that can be a good compromise. But we had, a, like, there's this one really memorable project that we worked on where we literally had gone through seven rounds of designs and we finally got to sign off and it was this huge committee of people involved in the process and the exec they finally showed it to the executive director without having consulted with her first and she just went, oh my god, I hate green. I, I can't believe you went with green. And we literally just had to go all the way back to the drawing board because she just couldn't get past it. It was like, really wish that somebody had thought to show her round three of the, the mock-ups before, you know? So, yeah. Um, all right. Another option that can be effective if you have a particularly large group of stakeholders is to use surveys. Um, but we do caution against design by committee here because it can get into that point. It's very, very important to tie the goals of your redesign um, to your overall organizational objectives. So um, if, for example, your five-year uh, plan as an organization is focused on research, then you are probably going to want to prioritize a really kick-ass publication library online 
and it would probably be a higher strategic priority for you than generating a lot of user con user generated content. Um, you know, while we are great believers in broad consultation, uh, it's very important not to let a sea of voices overwhelm the people who are kind of at the center and really closely tied in to the objectives of the organization and who are also most accountable, right? So. Um, uh, I guess be thoughtful about who and when you ask for input um, and, and make sure it's clear like, okay, I'm actually accountable to the board or I'm accountable to the ED or I'm accountable to our membership for achieving our organizational mission and if we fall flat on this thing then I'm, I'm going to, my feet are going to be held to the fire. Your relationship with the project is going to be different than somebody who's got a more tangential uh, relationship with the organization. So. Um, I've identified some places where it can be helpful just to share input with your broader team. Um, so these are the people who aren't coming to every meeting, but maybe just want to kind of see status reports or updates from time to time. It's kind of a soft way to invite input without getting bogged down in collaborative group process. So um, one is the priority setting, like I talked about at the beginning. So this is your meeting, your big brainstorming meeting. Uh, so priority setting for key metrics. And, uh, and for new and improved functionality, that's a really important place and helpful place to get the broadest possible group of people in the room. Uh, second place would be just prior to design sign-off. Um, so it's too late for them to give detailed input, but it's not too late for somebody from communications to pipe up and mention that you're actually, you have the wrong version of the logo in the header or something like that. Uh, it can be really helpful to just kind of show it to everybody and people will catch things that you may have become blind to in the course of, of the, the process. Um, things like, uh, I don't see a donate button anywhere on the site. That's a good one to catch too. Um, about a week before launch is a good time to invite kind of beta testers within your organization. So this is kind of late enough in the process that hopefully you have the majority of your content in place. Um, although we've certainly um, witnessed people doing burning the midnight, midnight oil uh, right before launch date. Uh, but invite those beta testers and, and proofreaders for the content. Um, so those have to be people who can work around minor bugs as they're being fixed because you are going to have bugs happening at that point still. So they need to be people who are not going to freak out if they see spilling errors um, and get so obsessed with the spilling errors that they can't see the bigger picture. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so make sure that they're not, you know, the most, the most careful spell checkers that you have maybe shouldn't be released on the site until like a day before lunch, or even the day of lunch, or the day after lunch, once you've actually had time to go and proofread your own content. Um, immediately after lunch is a great time to bring everybody into the room and celebrate with everybody, throw a party, invite your staff and your members and your board. Because um, really what you'll, what's typically going to happen for you, the people at the center of the project, is you're going to be totally out of steam for the project at this point. Um, you're going to be totally exhausted, you never want to look at the website again, uh, it's totally exhausting, and the idea of doing all the post-launch stuff, like actually promoting the site, is going to feel totally overwhelming. So what you want to do then is just gather the clan, bring them on in, tell them that their job now is to promote the site on your behalf, and give them some very clear ways on how they can do that. So uh, what are the features, that the, the new features that they can promote? Um, do you want them to comment on the blog? Do you want them to submit content? Do you want them to create user profiles on the site? What are all the ways they can get involved? It's a great way to kind of rally everybody and, and help them feel really involved in the pro project. Um, they can post links to Facebook. They can sign up for the, whatever this stuff is. Uh, just tell them exactly how they can help and make it easy for them is the key, key thing. Um, okay, I did want to just briefly touch on things that you can do to write a better RFP. So, um, really these tips apply to any conversation that you may have with a vendor. So, it's not necessarily, like, it's not necessarily restricted to stuff that goes into a formal request for proposals. Um, it can also just be you're simply talking to an agency or two. So, the key thing to remember really is that uh, web designers are problem solvers by trade. Um, so I'd encourage you to avail yourself of that. You don't need to know what the solutions are to every problem that you have. Um, so what's really helpful for us is for you to bring us your challenges um, and not necessarily prescribe what you think are the solutions. I mean, it's 
super helpful if you have identified some of the solutions. That's awesome. Um, but sometimes we get RFPs where it's literally like, you guys have done all of the planning and it's like so locked down already that there's very little room for us to really bring our expertise to the table. So walking that, that line is, is always helpful. Um, but more importantly, just don't feel like you need to know everything or like you need to know exactly what it is you need. Um, so. Um, We've reviewed today several processes that are going to basically help you come up with the information that a vendor really needs um, in order to design a solution that meets that achieves your goal. So um, you can easily include all of that information in an RFP if you write one or with your vendors when you meet with them uh, to give them some context as to why you're pursuing a redesign at, at, at this time. So get, sharing them with them your goals, sharing with them who your audiences and your communities are that you want to reach. Um, some of your statistics, uh, all of that kind of stuff is really, really helpful for us in terms of trying to understand what your goals and priorities are. And it's actually much more helpful than just seeing a laundry list of requirements. So uh, if I get an RFP that says, uh, we need an event calendar and a publication library, and the publication library has to be searchable on these three different types of things, um, I, I know how to build that. Uh, but I don't understand why I'm building it. So ha having the why piece is, is really, really helpful because if I hear the why, I may be able to recommend what I think is actually a better solution or a more efficient solution or a, uh, just a slight twist on what you've suggested that I, that I know has worked for other clients really well. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so like, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna stop repeating myself about that. Um, other things vendors will want to know. So they want to know uh, your challenges. So what's not working right now? Um, again, try not to jump to too many conclusions about uh, what the solutions are if you can help it, but, um, but just state the challenges. Uh, talk about your audiences. Talk about uh, where your existing website content stands. Uh, if you know, like, you know, we talk a lot about issue X on our website, but we haven't been talking about this other thing that's actually been a huge focus for us for the last 18 months and we've just never managed to figure out how to integrate that on our website. Um, that's also really helpful background information for us to have. Um, who's on your team and who the key sign-off authority is? Um, mostly it's just helpful for us to know that you've considered that, um, but um, it's, it's also helpful for us, especially if we're trying to figure out timelines, to know how, how big a group are we working with, how many people do we need to engage with during the process, um, and, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and just what are your top priorities for the redesign? That's like the number one thing we really need to know to do our job well. Um, I have a recap here, but I think I've already covered this stuff, so I'm going to breeze past it. Um, I do want to get into Q&A, and I'm going to do my one brief 20-second promotional pitch, which is who Raised Eyebrow is and what we do. Um, I just want to say uh, we're a, web, we're a web design company and strategy company that loves working with people who are um, focusing on social good and want to connect with their communities online. Um, so if, you, if that sounds like you or somebody you know, we would love to talk to you. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So that's it. And I'd love to take questions and hear what you have to say. And I also want to say I know there are like quite a lot of experts in the room. I you know, recognize some faces in the room. So I'd love to also hear other you know, geniuses talk about what uh, has worked well for you in these processes and, and any advice you might have to share as well. So. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so where does your exist? The question was, uh, what does it mean when I... What did I mean when I said, uh, tell your developers where your current website content stands? Um, were you here for the bit about the content inventory, the spreadsheet of content? Yeah, so really what I was just talking about there is, is just having a sense of like how up to date is your content, how well does it reflect your, your current kind of plans for messaging, is it, do you feel like your website content is connecting well with your visitors? Um, do you want to have a writer working with you? Like, do you have a sense that you maybe want to engage a writer or, uh, or need to really totally overhaul the navigation structure of your website? Um, just a sense, kind of, I mean, it doesn't need to be in detail, 
but a sense of kind of what your content priorities are in addition to your functional priorities. So there's kind of the tech tool side of things, and then there's also the, the messaging and the, the heart of what's being communicated. Is that helpful? Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering if you've ever gone through this before. So I'm on a team right now that's got a, what I would branding website. There's three of us. I think I know what I'm doing. One other guy can like, is it good enough to send an email? And then the third guy the websites don't work, it's a waste of time, we're going to blow a bunch of time and money on this and it's never going to have any sort of result. Yeah. Uh, have you gone through that and maybe have you addressed those kind of people and maybe what I tell them that we just want to get this thing moving forward? Um, so I think the question is, and correct me if I've misunderstood, um, how do you deal with naysayers who just think the web is a waste of time? Yeah, well, I've already told you. Within your organization? Yeah. Yeah. He says it's, that he's gone through this before. He's a company that has spent almost hundreds of thousands of dollars on a website that ended up not converting anything. Mm. But they also didn't really do anything that would pay in the designer or the other. They had a web that didn't really pass that. I see, okay. So it's not, he's not just skeptical about the web in general. He's had a very difficult experience in the past of working with vendors who were like maybe not accountable to the goals and who didn't deliver on their promises. And also internally within the organization, there wasn't sufficient support to promote the, the website. Yeah, the website was never marketed. So yeah. it's like, you know, they opened the store, but they forgot to tell anyone that it's sold. Right. Um, yeah, well, so... I find it useful to kind of just talk in metaphors about that, like, just like you have. Uh, you know, so to say, okay, so the, it sounds like there's two parts of the equation here. Um, one is it sounds like we need to bring in a vendor who can deliver accountability for, you know, for the goals that we've set. Um, so we can talk about some ways in which we could engage a vendor to be accountable to the, to the goals of the project, right? So maybe it's that you, you know, phase in the, well, first of all, I mean that you're vetting vendors in a way that helps you understand what their process is and how they evaluate the success of, their, of the websites and projects that they do. Um, but, you know, you're checking references for all of those people and, you know, just like you would with any consultant, I think in the tech world there are a lot of, there are a lot of kind of fly-by-night operations and it's still a bit of a Wild West situation sometimes. I'm less so now than it was, you know, 10 years ago, but I know there are, I mean, I hear those stories every single day, right? People phone me up and they're like, uh, I hired a web designer and they flaked out when they were 80% of the way done and I, they haven't returned any of my emails or phone calls for two months. And I'm like, I don't know how that gets tolerated because it doesn't get tolerated. In, I mean, it happens in other professions, but I mean, it's like maybe hair, hairdressers, but like I don't see it happening in a lot of other consultative profess professions, you know? Um, so, so building in some accountability to your, your engagement with your vendor and contract with your vendor um, can sometimes assuage some of the kind of business level of concerns that people have, right? Like, what is the actual return I'm getting on my investment? That's a totally legitimate question to ask. Um, so I think validating concerns is always helpful, you know, and then helping to kind of in, uh, engage them in, in figuring out a solution. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's really important that you kind of identify for them what how you make a website successful from within the organization, right? I mean, as a, as a vendor, I can only ever pr provide you with the framework and, you know, the organization is the one who needs to carry the message and the heart and the outreach and all of that stuff, you know, there's only so much as a vendor that we can provide in that regard. Um, so, yeah, so reaching out to your list. But one of the things you can do with your vendor, if you choose to hire one, is ask them to engage with you in that part of the process. And help and ask them, like, so what do you do to engage with your clients after launch? Um, like, one of the things we do uh, is, for every project, we set out metrics of success at the beginning of the project. And then post-launch, we have a three-month check-in with our clients. Um, to go through those measures of success and evaluate like how we've done on them. Uh, we do it three months after launch because you can't always tell on launch date what's happening there. So that's something you can kind of interview your vendors about and find out what they're willing to, to do with you post-launch to help facilitate that process.
Anyway, I'm not sure that I told you anything you didn't already know there, but maybe it affirms your... I'm always a fan of just asking more and more questions. Like, it just asking people, yes, yeah, so tell me more about what didn't work for you last time. Help me understand how we could address this better this time. Um, would you agree that we cannot just ignore the web and that it's not going away? Um, or do you really feel like it just doesn't even deserve a line item in the budget? Because if it's the latter, we may have an irreconcilable difference of opinion. You know? And depending on where this person lives in the hierarchy of your organization, that could just be like a non-starter right there, right? If they're in charge of the budget and they believe the web has no value, then you may not, it may not be a fight you can win, you know? So I, I but yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was wanting to ask about scope in the sense that when you start these projects, you know, people might not have quite the understanding of how big it might get, or you start digging into it and it starts to expand like that. How do you deal with defining scope at the beginning and changes throughout the process? Um, how do we deal with defining the scope of the project and dealing with changes to the scope over the course of the project? Um, so there are kind of two answers to that question. There's the question of how do you deal with it internally within your organization and how do vendors typically deal with that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so what can be really challenging is at the outset of the project when you're doing that input gathering meeting, um, you may not have the information, like you may not have the background to be able to assess uh, the scope of what people are asking for, right? So, you know, people may see something on another website that they think is really cool and they want one of those. Um, and they don't know how big or small a request that is and you may not know and you may have no way of knowing until you start talking to vendors. Um, so what's helpful to know though is to do that initial, this is why it's so important to do that initial prioritization of things um, by how closely it aligns with your organizational mission. How much impact do we think this can have in getting us closer to our actual goals? So um, there is this incredibly cool whiz-bang design thing that we could do um, and how much impact, how many people is it going to bring to us um, do we think, you know, how, how much, what's the level of engagement we can expect to have from it, all of that kind of stuff. Um, that can be a really helpful way of of figuring out how much you're going to kind of allow it to change the scope of the project. Um, uh, I think it's important to figure out, with, with in terms of like changes of scope after you've actually signed a contract, um, you know, you've set down what it is you think you need and then, you know, you find it. I really, I, I'm kind of a... This is a tough one for me to answer because I feel like I have my process of the way that I like to work and I feel like it's right and so I'm going to share with you why I think it's right. <laughs> um, and other people have different processes but, um, but the way that raised eyebrow works is that the first part of every project is what we call the functional requirements gathering phase or the requirements gathering phase. And what we do is we do a couple of things. We sit down with you, we figure out who your audiences are. Um, what your goals are, what your measures of success are, and then we start scoping out the functional requirements for the site. And we start looking through, okay, so you guys need a publications library. So how many publications, how do they need to be organized, how are people going to navigate through that, blah, 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 blah. And we break it down into all of these little pieces and we, and we write extremely detailed technical specifications that we then ask you to sign off on before we go any further. Um, if there's any change of scope, from what we had initially imagined when we gave you an estimate, we will tell you before you sign off on that document. Um, I just feel like that's fair on all fronts, because I want to know as a vendor if I'm being asked to do more work than I originally anticipated, um, because I don't want to have to eat the extra cost, right? So I have an incentive. Um, and, um, and I feel like it's important from your end in order to evaluate like your satisfaction with the project, right? Because if, uh, if you're not able to get all of the things you need in the budget that you have, then that's going to make you an unhappy customer. So, um, so my other incentive is I want to continue to have your business over time, I want to get referrals from you, I want to have happy clients in my portfolio. Um, so there's that secondary um, or sometimes primary objective to it too. Um, so 
There are often little changes that come up after that initial scoping definition conversation. Sometimes things will happen when you're already, you know, you've already built out the whole test site and oh my god, we left out this really important thing. Um, but my, ex my experience is that when you do that kind of thorough planning up front, that you can avoid as much of that as possible. Um, if I can just be even more detailed and go on a little more about this, because it's a really important, I think it's actually a really critical piece, um, is um, the second thing you can ask your vendor to do is to produce an alpha website for you. Um, so this is while you're going through the design phase of the project um, and you're you know, looking at all the pretty mock-ups, um, they, they should already be able to start building you um, an unstyled, undesigned website that has all the functionality that you asked for. That'll really help you start to see, and you'll, again, it's another early warning system. Um, once you can actually click through stuff and play with it and go, oh, God, this is totally not what I meant by the topics uh, navigation in the publications library. It's totally not working the way that I expected it to. Um, so that's another way to kind of be able to flag that stuff early. Because earlier, the earlier you catch the stuff, the less impact it has on budgets, typically. So um, uh, now, you know, in terms of like scope creep that's just about having a whole lot of players in the room and having everybody have different opinions about what, how things are supposed to work, this is where the, like, I, I do appreciate like having a somewhat hierarchical model uh, for the, you know, the website committee and figuring out who's going to get to make those final calls. Um, but um, anyway, I, I don't know if I've gone like t totally off the road in terms of what you were asking. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So everyone should require everyone to adhere to raised eyebrows process is what I think the takeaway was from that answer. <laughs> But this is not unique to raised eyebrow, I'll just say. There's like lots of lots of developer developers who work this way. Yeah. I was gonna ask a similar questions, more about resources. Yeah. So when you have an entity and like, hey, we need a redesign or we need to do something with a lister, can you just do it or let's get somebody to do it? And they say here's X amount. But an actual fact the opportunity is so much more. So I know you've been external, but internally or within other groups, how do you leverage ways to sell? Um, the impact when you're dealing with people who don't or, like fear the web, right? And so that's the key. Like, we need a Twitter. Can you get us like 50 followers or 100 followers? And maybe it'll get retweeted, and that'll be so successful. And you're like, no, that's not the point, right? And how do you actually sell it to a point where they actually can see before it happens that it's not a thousand dollar contract, it's a ten thousand or a fifty thousand dollar contract, and they'll see tangible outcomes after that? Like, in did everybody hear that? Okay. I don't know if, it, if the sound could make it around the corner. Yes? Yes? Nod? No? Shake heads? Um, okay. I'm seeing mostly nods, so I'm going to assume that that was uh, heard for the most part. Um, I think the key is just educating people. And so what I've seen work for other, organization, or other organizations is that, you know, the internal evangelist, so that's probably you, um, actually convenes a meeting of all of the people who, all of the decision makers and influencers in the organization, and teaches them about social media, um, and uh, and teaches them about the broader ecosystem of social media, so that they're not tunnel visioned on Twitter followers or email list or whatever the tool is, because it's really really easy to get bogged down in the tools, and and it's not they're not doing it out of um, spite; they're doing it out of ignorance, right? Um, in much the same way, you know, that I would about topics that I know nothing about. So. Um, yeah, so it's, it can feel like a bit of a laborious process, but there can be real value in doing it. And, and the, so the, the frame that I've often seen people put on it is, um, you have to start with the high-level objectives and help them understand, okay, here's, what, here's why I'm talking to you about this. <laughs> I'm talking to you about this because this is changing the landscape of the way that our constituents engage with us. And, um, and, it's, and it's really critically important that we engage with our constituents in a way that is relevant to them today and that's going to continue to be relevant to them in the future. Um, and if you can kind of paint that picture for them and help them understand this isn't just about Twitter. We're not just going to sit and waste your time for an hour talking about Twitter. This is about understanding like the, the ecosystem of the social web and what, what our role as an organization is in it and also what your individual roles within this room are going to be within it. So helping them to understand that social media for, for an organization is not a task for one person or one department, right? Um, and why that's true, like why is it true that it needs to be 
Um, I don't think we need this anymore. So I'm going to just, yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to. Um, <laughs> So, um, helping them understand why, you know, everybody in the organization actually needs to be engaging on some level, which doesn't mean everybody needs a Twitter account, right? It's just, but it's like, when you are um, writing that piece for the email newsletter that you do every month, that is part of our social media strategy, you know? When you are writing your donor ask, and it doesn't anywhere in the letter reference any way that people can interact with us online, that's part of our social media strategy, you know, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So educating everybody in the organization can be very, very valuable. And just having like a one hour, maybe 90 minute session with them on that can be incredibly valuable. And there's some tons and tons of resources on, um, on this online. If you go to SlideShare and you just Google social, or not Google, if you search SlideShare for social media for nonprofits, slide decks, you can just lift somebody else's slide deck and walk your people through it. Um, I have one on there. Feel free to use it. Like, uh, like it outlines like the four pillars. Of